What's up with Europe? That's what we're here to discuss today. And before we move on to the difficult parts, I'd like to mention a few happy facts, even if only briefly. Um, as you may have seen in the news recently, the European economy grew at 2.5% in 2017. That's the highest rate since 2007, and a rate that currently outstrips the United States. Unemployment is looking better, too. It's down to 7.3% in the EU28, the lowest rate since 2008, though of course it remains abnormally high, particularly among the young, and particularly in places like Spain, Greece, and our inner cities. Capital spending, meanwhile, is rising. That may sound like an obscure figure. It's up to 3.7%, a full percentage point higher than last year. It's actually an important sign of business confidence and an indication that many believe that life, at least here in Europe, will be better in the days, months, and years to come. But something is up, of course. Something's, of course, not quite right. And it's that something that we are here to discuss today. Because the truth is, even with the recent economic success, the years 2016 and 2017 gave us all pause to reflect. It wasn't so much that the great pendulum of politics swung so wildly in those years, seeing governments handed from one party to another in a ritual we know well here. It dates back more than hundreds of years to the Greeks and the Vikings. Rather, it was who was swinging the pendulum and where the pendulum was heading and what those swings said about the very foundation of post-war prosperity and the pillars of liberal democracy upon which so much of that success rests. I'm talking, of course, about what is usually called populism. And what exactly is this populism? Well, in its purest, rawest form, it's an effort to divide society against itself. It aims to give simple answers to complex problems. And even worse, it often gives the wrong answers. It gives answers which could themselves easily become self-fulfilling prophecies and bring about the very dystopia that they claim to see around us each and every day. But you know, we're not without some success on this front here in Europe. And people may have forgotten, but when the historians get around to telling the story, they will remember that Europe was the gate at which the barbarians were put to rest. The Dutch elections in 2017 were the first. That could have gone a very different way, by the way. And so were the French elections. And we have one of the leading architects of En Marche with us here today, Jean Pisani, who will speak in a moment. This was, of course, one of the most successful efforts to build a governing majority around a progressive agenda in recent times. But how do you govern in times like this? And how do you campaign? What are the issues? The European Commission has given us five scenarios in a recent white paper, ranging from carry on to doing much more together. And we'll surely talk about some of those today. But the question I want to put on the table, the one I'd like to address to each of our speakers, and also to those of you in the audience as well, is how do we shore up the political center? How do we make the center something that is more than just a call to preserve the current status quo? How do we turn it into a driver and a vehicle of change? And how do we turn it into something that will give our democracy the strength it needs to last from generation to generation and allow us to continue into this difficult 21st century with the confidence we see starting to manifest itself so clearly today? These are difficult questions, of course, and I can think of no better speaker to kick us off than Nick Clegg. Uh, Nick, you're, of course, uh, welcome to the Lisbon Council for the very first time today. Um, for those of you who don't know Nick, a brief biography, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, he studied uh, social anthropology at Cambridge. It's a good start on the European project, I believe, um, before getting an advanced degree in European politics at the College of Europe in Bruges. He speaks four languages fluently, Spanish, Dutch, German, and what am I leaving now? English. English. <laughs> Spanish, Dutch, German, and English. Uh, and he has impeccable European credentials. He, of course, was a member of the cabinet for Sir Leon Britton, former vice president of the European Commission, member of the European Parliament for East Midlands, where he became the first liberal Democrat elected to, the Europe, to, to that post since the 1930s. And later, he became a member of parliament for Sheffield Hallam, leader of the liberal Democrats, and eventually, as we all know, deputy prime minister. Nick, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us today. Could you please share with us your vision of a renewed, revitalized Europe? And maybe, just maybe, you'll say a few words as well about how you see the United Kingdom and progressives like yourselves within it. Thank you. The floor is yours. Well, th thank you, Paul. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you for being so generous, because you're your, your um, exam question for today, as uh, Paul has just described to us, is to set out ideas about how we can shore up the political centre and boost the cause of Europe. 
Uh, so I think it's extremely kind of you to invite someone from a country that has uh, abandoned both Europe and the political centre to speak to you about it. I can assure you that uh, I, as a Brit, have nothing to say of any great value since I think Britain, uh, tragically in my view, is, uh, is departing from uh, its long-standing centrist political traditions just as it is uh, departing from uh, its role in, in Europe as well. But notwithstanding those caveats uh, and mindful of the fact that uh, in both uh, Jean and Nadia you have some uh, really first-rate speakers and I don't want to stand between you and them, I really want to just make three observations about the politics of the centre, the cause of Europeanism in a time of great political uh, volatility and at a time when political populism, as described so well by Paul, uh, is as beguiling and seductive as it is to so many millions of our fellow citizens across, across Europe. But before I come to those three points, I really just want to make a couple of sort of throat-clearing observations. And the first one is, is simply this, is that... Um, I don't think the answer, uh, this is going to sound more challenging than it is, the answer doesn't lie here, doesn't lie in Brussels, doesn't lie in conferences such as this, doesn't even actually lie in tweaking or changing policy, doesn't lie in further institutional changes or intergovernmental conferences or new treaties. Um, the answer, such as it does, lies deep in the roots of the fabric of uh, political debate uh, in, uh, in each and every single uh, member state. Uh, by the way, I also say it, it, it doesn't lie in, in, uh, in the undergrowth of policy because both Jean and Nadia know so much more about policy than I do. So if I feel I can somehow talk myself into, uh, uh, into um, uh, giving support to my wider generalities rather than the expert observations they will make. But it nonetheless, I think it's important to remember this. Um, Europe, the genius of European integration and its dilemma is that it is a, an exercise, the likes of which has never been tried anywhere else in the world, of extraordinarily sophisticated supranational governance, which relies in turn on the political cultures and democratic legitimacy of its member states and its sub-national communities. And that has been the constant um, dynamic, but also constraint on European uh, integration, that we as a cluttered, crowded uh, patchwork of small, medium-sized, some larger countries in this extraordinary hemisphere of ours have worked out that we can do things much better together we, than we can apart but we haven't worked out how to do that in a collective democratic political enterprise. I wish it were otherwise. I served five very happy years in the European Parliament with Sir Graham Watson uh, and others. But it is, in my view, a, a given fact that just as globalisation has eradicated borders, just as we occupy a world in which the nation-state and the rate reach of the nation-state is ever more limited and anachronistic, ironically enough, at the same time, people's political loyalties have become more rather than less local. So it's like a great sort of accordion. We need to govern up here, but we can only govern up here if we can secure support down there. And that, in my view, remains one of the great, um, one of the great dilemmas. If you overdo it at the top, Without doing your homework at the bottom, you will lose people's support. If you overdo it at the bottom and don't dream big at the top, you don't actually provide the people you care for and your constituents with the jobs, the security, the prosperity that they deserve. And that, in a nutshell, is the political dilemma, the so-called democratic uh, deficit. And much though I am certainly known in the United Kingdom as probably one of the most ardent pro-European British political figures, I am and remain stubbornly quite Anglo-Saxon uh, in my belief that you mustn't outrun the communities and the cultures and the institutions which confer democratic legitimacy on the decisions you take on behalf um, of society. And that is why my first caveat, before I come to the three points I want to make to you, is that um, much of 
that which needs to be achieved to thwart populism, to champion Europe, to anchor the centre ground, needs to be done in the grist and the fabric of day-to-day -day democratic combat on the ground and in the streets and the communities of our own uh, countries. The second observation I would make is that if you look at the history of European integration, amongst many other things, a certain sort of economic determinism has always driven the way in which European integration has been planned, promoted and unveiled. And economic steps have been taken one after the other in order to promote a longer term or a wider political objective. So the creation of the European coal and steel community, the creation of the common agricultural uh, policy. These were in many ways surrogates for a more full-throated political undertaking. Remember the ill-fated European Defence Union, which was uh, uh, vetoed before the European coal and steel community was, uh, uh, was, was launched. In other words, the genius of those founding, and they were all pretty well fathers, um, Schumann, Monet, etc., alas, um, was that they realised that to serve the wider political ends of European integration, it was best done through incremental economic means. And so it continued. Started with the European Steel Community, started with agriculture, in the period of shortage and an economic uh, a disarray in the wake of the Second World War, and then, of course, evolved fitfully in fits and starts, um, two steps forward, one step back generally, uh, evolved into the common market, into the single market, into the single currency, and so on. And there was an assumption, certainly in the 10 years or so that um, I worked here uh, in, in Brussels, in the European Commission for five years, for five years in the European Parliament, there was a, an assumption, often a rather unspoken assumption, that politics would catch up with those political facts, that as long as you could uh, occuper le terrain with these economic initiatives, that the political institutions, both domestically and here in Brussels, would, would, would catch up. Um, and I think uh, that has almost gone into complete reverse. 2008, the financial crash of 2008, which remains, certainly for my generation, um, second only or maybe equal to the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989 as the most seminal moment in the modern history of our continent. 2008 did many things, destroyed many people's livelihoods, threw a lot of people out of work, created untold political turmoil, which is still carrying on, but it did something very profound. It shattered completely the public's intuitive faith in these economic initiatives promulgated by their political masters, by the political elite, by the political governments. In other words, the assumption, which had prevailed pretty well non-stop from the post, immediate post-war period onwards, that governments administrators, economists, academics, the thinking classes could, on behalf of the people, promote new ideas for economic integration, which, however sometimes reluctantly and erratically, the people would eventually follow, broadly held true until 2008. It has completely collapsed in 2000. You can no longer assume when thinking about centre-ground politics, the politics of reason, of tolerance, of internationalism, and particularly when thinking about the politics of European integration, that all you need to do is, is point in that direction, create a new acronym, shroud in all sorts of technocratic obscurity, and somehow people will, in the end, uh, uh, follow. I think in, in many ways, whilst for a long time we thought that politics would follow economics. Increasingly, in my view, it is the case that politics has a life of its own. And as a life of its own, which exhibit number one, Brexit, can lead to outcomes which every economist will tell you is irrational. In other words, the, the parting of company between what is considered to be economically rational and politically fruitful in my view, is changing 
all of our domestic politics, but also changing the politics of European uh, into, I mean, there are other reasons as well. The, the advent of um, extremist terrorism, violence, the um, crisis of, of, of managing the movement of large numbers of migrants and refugees across the Mediterranean. These things have also instilled, I think, a visceral concern in many millions of our fellow citizens about their own safety and about the identity of their own communities, which again pulls in a different direction to the economic determinism which has governed so much thinking uh, in, in uh, European uh, governments for such a long period of time in the post-war period. Anyway, those are my opening observations. Now to the three points I wanted to make, uh, which are really very plain vanilla observations, but ones which I think are nonetheless important to reiterate. And the first one is this. Um, yes, as Paul quite rightly described, at a time when many people thought, thought that the election of Trump, the referendum uh, in the United Kingdom on Brexit, when many people thought that, that was the begin those were the two first dominoes, uh, and, and it was only a matter of time for dominoes across the European continent to fall. I remember reading breathless predictions from portentous commentators in endless European newspapers that, of course, Podemos would win in Spain, of course, Alternativa for Deutschland would win in Germany, of course, Gert Gert Wilders would win, of course, uh, uh, Le Pen would win in France, and so on. And so it is a source of great relief that that did not happen in Spain in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany. All of that is true. But actually, my great concern now is that that has given way to a certain complacency. It's been accompanied, of course, thankfully, by a, what appears to be a widespread and sustainable pattern of economic growth across the Eurozone, which has also created a sense of, gosh, we not only dodged the, the populist bullet, but we're also able to now uh, point our electorates and our peoples towards a better future. But I really worry about this complacency. I really, really worry about this complacency. I hear lots of people say, quite rightly, that it is an unusual constellation, and broadly speaking, a happy one, that in Emmanuel Macron we have this remarkable, remarkable um, figure who's not only exceptionally good at politics, but is also exceptionally committed to the cause of European integration and internationalism. And that is a wonderful thing. And that the coincidence of that with what looks possibly to be a new uh, German coalition government committed to further steps towards European integration, particularly as far as the rebalancing of the uh, Eurozone is concerned between the sort of creditor north and the debtor south. And people say, this is, a, this is our moment. This is our moment. We can now, having been paralyzed a little by the fear that the populist tsunami was going to sweep us all aside, we can now move forward. I think it's really, really important to be mindful of how fragile this is. Boy, do I know it. <laughs> One moment in politics, you're up. The next moment, you're down. Right. Nothing lasts in politics. And things last for much less time in modern politics than they ever have done before. There is a volatility and a velocity to, to, uh, to politics, the likes of which we have uh, not seen. Look at the strength of the populist, chauvinist movements across the European Union now, in government, in large parts of Central and Eastern Europe, in power pretty well. In, in Vienna, able to mobilize millions of voters in Scandinavia, in Germany, in France. So the first, perhaps obvious point to make is, as we work out how to use the opportunity of, that is available to us, probably the greatest danger is ourselves, is a sense that, oh, well, all we need to do is resume business um, as usual, that somehow this was a, an aberrant interruption, uh, a small aftershock uh, in the wake of the 2008 crisis. No, no. Uh, populism is now much more part of the European bloodstream, and in my view, it'll 
remain as such for a, a long period of time. And, and by the way, one of the observations I derive from that is that if we are to move forward as a continent, I hate to say this, if you are to move forward as a continent, um, in the future, it must be done with the support and with the legitimacy of the, of the politics down here. So Jean and I were just talking about this earlier. Uh, much though I, and I don't have his expertise, not remotely, on what is really needed in order to stabilize and entrench a, a prosperous and positive future for the Eurozone, but my reading from a distance of what is being included in the mooted coalition agreement between the CDU, CSU and the SDP, that, that those passages about Eurozone reform, which I understand have been inserted at the insistence of Martin Schulz and the SDP, I agree with them here intellectually, but it would be very, very dangerous to act upon that if the German, next German government is not properly convinced that it's put the case to the German people and the German people understand what they are committed to. Gone are the days that any government, any prime minister, any minister should ever again try and enter into a new act of European integration without being very open and very overt about what it means. Integration by stealth does not work. Second point, know thy enemy. Um, I've made the point already. Um, populism is stronger, more entrenched and more um, more organized and more powerful, I think many people sometimes give it uh, credit for. And maybe I can here, and I haven't even mentioned the dreaded B word, Brexit. Um, oh, I mentioned it once, no. Um, maybe I can just give you an illustration of what's happened in the United Kingdom. It's not, it's, it's possibly atypical, and I'm not gonna pretend it can be easily repeated elsewhere. But of the many extraordinary, and in my view, fateful things that have happened in my country, is the emergence of what is in effect a Brexit elite. What the United Kingdom has in effect witnessed is an ideological coup. Now, it's an ideological coup which has fed off and mobilized and very intelligently, if cynically, drawn on the legitimate sense of grievance and anger and frustration that millions of people, particularly those on middle and low incomes, have about the status quo. And to that extent, the eruption of anger in the referendum was entirely authentic, was generated by an authentic feeling amongst many people in the United Kingdom that the status quo, particularly after 2008, was not serving them and their families well. I'd go, by the way, so I can't prove this, but you can't disprove it either. I, I, I suspect that if 2008 had not happened, I doubt very much the Rust Belt would have voted for Trump in the numbers that uh, uh, the, uh, voters that did, and I doubt very much the United Kingdom would have voted for Brexit. But here's the thing. Much though that grassroots sense of discontent is authentic, it was um, fed upon, manipulated, um, and, and in many ways directed by an identifiable Brexit elite, who in the United Kingdom so happened to be, almost all of them, almost without exception, very rich, very angry, older men, many of whom don't either live or pay taxes in the United Kingdom. The hedge fund uh, kingpins who use their very deep pockets to fund UKIP, fund right-wing think tanks, fund uh, the uh, anti-European wing of the Conservative Party, the media propriety, proprietors, the Murdoch, uh, no, the Barclay brothers, Rupert Murdoch, some of the editors of some of these almost unhinged right-wing newspapers, Paul Dacre at the, uh, at the Daily Mail and others, all of them might be different, might hail from different places. As I say, many of them don't even actually spend very much time in the United Kingdom. But they're all collectively very powerful, very rich, and able to exercise immense influence over politicians and over the political uh, debate. And here's the thing. They're all united however different they are in other respects, by a simple ideological shared assertion that the United Kingdom should become a low-tax, low-welfare, low-protection, 
kind of cowboy economy. And they have this sort of sepia-tinted view that somehow the United Kingdom was at its best when it was a swashbuckling, gunboat diplomacy wielding, buccaneering, free trading, libertarian, small state country. And that all these perfidious, pen pushing foreigners in Brussels have stopped that masculine, muscular Britishness from expressing itself uh, over so many years. That's what unites them. <laughs> you agree? Oh dear. Oh deary, deary me. That is what they believe. And here's the, here's the interesting thing. They would never, ever, ever get the support of the British people if they put that proposition openly in an election. So they have used legitimate fury and indignation about what has happened, particularly after 2008, and a long-standing ambivalence in the United Kingdom about our membership of the European Union, to prosecute covertly an ideological objective for which they would never win a democratic mandate in the United Kingdom. And all I would say is that if you want to fight back against something, you have to understand the power, the financial clout, and the ideological purpose of your, and it's not enough simply to sort of, in lovely settings like this, dismiss all populists as crazy, irrational, and so on. No, they are much more organized, and from their point of view, rational and methodical uh, than, uh, than I think sometimes people give credit for. And certainly in the United Kingdom, uh, any <coughs> attempt to seize back the initiative for all of those reasons will not only require the right thinking, but it'll require money. It'll require organization. It'll require an ability to make one's voice heard uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the media. And so much though it is always enjoyable to condemn the zany irrationalities of populists and extremists, and much though I'd like to think that everybody will shake themselves free of the pixie dust of, uh, of, uh, of populist politics and wake up one day and the whole Rust Belt in America wakes up one day and says, we're all Democrats. So everybody wakes up in the United Kingdom and says, we're all liberal Democrats. It doesn't work like that. You have to organize. You have to raise money. You have to make sure that your voice is heard. Third and final reason, Paul, sorry if I'm uh, outstaying my welcome on this platform. Um, <clears throat> and this is something very specifically uh, aimed at something I encountered when I worked here in Brussels. And it is this. Um, certainly, and it may well have changed, but certainly when I spent, as I say, a very happy, happy decade living and working here. There was a barely concealed, um, almost sneering disregard for the politics of identity and the, and the politics of patriotism. There was an assumption that patriotism was an old fashioned vestige of, a, of an order which was dying away and you could understand after the terrible bloodletting of two world wars in our continent, why people would feel such an aversion towards patriotism, because it had such negative connotations. And the very, the very genesis of European integration was to sort of go beyond and above the, the trap of patriotic politics. But it was a terrible misreading of what actually makes people tick. We are all tribal people. Miriam. And my three, our three adorable boys and myself, we went to see Arsenal play Everton at the Emirates Stadium in North London on Saturday. It was an excellent outcome. We won 5-1, for those of you who are Arsenal supporters. We were screaming with red-faced delight at Arsenal's rather uncharacteristically excellent performance <laughs> against Everton. The Everton supporters were almost drenched in their own tears. Such was their sorrow. The tribalism, you could feel it. That that comes from something really primitive. You can, might not like it, but that's who we are. We feel a tribal affiliation towards our family, towards our people, to our, towards our kith and our kin, towards our football team, towards our town, towards our region, towards our language, towards our religion. The, you can't wish that away. And so the only final point I would make in terms of the resurgence, I hope, of liberal politics is it is essential that liberals pay greater due regard to the need for everybody and for all of us 
to have a strong sense of place and location and identity. It is why, for instance, the European governments were asking for trouble when Schengen was created, a borderless uh, zone, without introducing external border controls. It's, I mean, look, with, with the hindsight, it was the, the naivety of it is shocking. You can either remove internal borders and introduce external borders, or you can remove external borders and retain internal borders. What you can't do is get rid of them all, because every community has a right somewhere to expect that someone on their behalf has some say about who's coming in and out of their community. And I think it is really important that liberals come to understand. Now, there are some signs that the, the new generation of liberal leaders do understand that. I talked about Macron before. Macron is bulletproof in his French patriotism. He's passionately pro-European, but no one would ever accuse him. I mean, for heaven's sake, I, I saw him the other day, uh, Jean holding up a baguette, claiming that I think the French baguette needs world heritage status or something, and I'm <laughs> exaggerating for effect. But there could, I mean, there, there could be no greater display of love for, for country and, and tribe. And Mark Rutte, the liberal prime minister of the Netherlands, um, understood that he needed to try, and some people might feel squeamish about this, but I understood why he did. He needed, in order to defeat Gert Wilders, he needed, to, he needed to demonstrate an understanding that you can't disregard people's concerns about their own place and their own identity. In, uh, in, in, in Nadia knows better than I do, Ciudadanos. I mean, I'm, I find this amazing. A liberal party, Ciudadanos, is now almost trying to outdo the Partido Popular in its commitment to sort of Spanish nationalism. Now, I may agree or disagree with it. I actually disagree with some of that. But it is at least a, in my view, an early sign that liberal internationalist politicians understand that you must also, um, while standing for Europe, do so wrapped in your own flag. And that internationalism and patriotism are not inconsistent with each other. Patriotic Europeanism is a perfectly consistent and compelling school of thought. So, no room for complacency, know thy enemy, embrace and don't shun patriotism. And with that short menu, which has been delivered at excessive length, I hope liberal politics can make a resurgence. Thank you very much. Wow, Nick, I, I, I have to say I'm really glad all I have to do is introduce the next speaker. I don't have to actually speak after you, because um, thank you for that. That was fascinating, a real tour de force. Look, our prodigal son is back. Jean, it's really nice to have you with us here in Brussels. He, as you know, was here for many years. He was the founding director of Bruegel, where he served at 10 years, and actually spent a large part of his childhood in Brussels, although we didn't have the pleasure of knowing each other um, back then. Um, he's a professor at the Herdy School now and at Sciences Po, and even more impressively, and I love this title, he was the Director for Program and Ideas for Emmanuel Macron's presidential campaign. And he's also more recently a principal author of a study called Reconciling Risk Sharing with Market Discipline, a Constructive Approach to Euro Area Reform, which if you haven't heard of this yet, it's a project uh, written by 14 French and German economists uh, that proposes uh, six reforms to revive the European financial, fiscal, and institutional architecture. Um, it's become tremendously important. How is it you put it, Nick, the up here and the down there? It's really important up here, and we'd like it to be important down there, because um, there's a lot of very good and very useful ideas for the European project in there, Jean. So thank you for continuing to exert leadership, even if you leave us behind here in Brussels. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, let me let me perhaps um, first um, you know, comment on a few things that uh, Nick said, and uh, then uh, go on and uh, make a few points, including on this uh, Franco-German uh, uh, paper. I I strongly agree with a number of things uh, you said. Uh, I have some nuances uh, on some other points. I think that your point about 2008 is is really important. Uh, it has been a failure. It has been a failure of of policy. Uh, and even more, the response that was actually good uh, from a, an economic standpoint. I mean, the, the you know Gordon Brown's response, uh, especially, was uh, absolutely uh, right. Uh, the uh, the common uh, effort to reflate, to you know, the response, avoid protectionism, 
and use the fiscal uh, instrument to avoid a depression. That was absolutely right. But that was understood as bailing out the banks. So that was understood as uh, making even more and going even more of the, in the direction that led us uh, to this crisis. So I think this, um, the mistakes are extremely costly. Mistakes of this magnitude are extremely costly politically, and I think you are absolutely right uh, in this regard. And um, we're still there, and we're still there because we're still uh, also in the shadow of this, uh, this depression. We're slowly going out of it, but what we have behind us, uh, especially in the Eurozone, not in the UK, is the last decade. And the last decade, you know, that uh, uh, was um, coined about the Latin American crisis of the 80s with profound consequences also. So, so those are not um, uh, events that uh, you know, leave people and leave the political scene uh, unaffected. You're absolutely right on that. Um, I think you're absolutely right on complacency. Uh, let me mention a few uh, numbers on the, on the French uh, um, election. You know, everybody remembers um, Macron's victory. Now, um, in this election, the traditional government parties, not, not including Macron, so the, the right and the Socialist Party, got 26% of the vote. Mm. And the party that really outside the, the policy spectrum of mainstream parties got, the candidates, got 48% of the vote. 48%. So Le Pen, Mélenchon, the smaller candidates, together that's 48. So the demand for change was enormous. And you know, a candidate uh, elected president with 24% of the vote in the first round, that's, that's something, that's an achievement, <coughs> that's an extraordinary achievement, but there should be no mistake on the interpretation. It doesn't mean that the French have turned you know, pro-market, pro-Europe, pro uh, politically liberal. No, not at all. Uh, it means that they voted for, for change because a candidate was able to capture the demand for, for, for change and also because he, he was lucky. He was lucky in this election because of a number of, uh, of domestic uh, developments. But there should be no mistake about the interpretation and there should be no mistake about the mandate he got from the electorate. Uh, he knows that very well. He knows about, you know, having a, doing a, as you know, I mean, doing a political campaign, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about the state of public opinion. You hear a lot what people uh, are telling you. Um, so um, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's something we should, uh, we should always remember. Uh, and what we're seeing, uh, as you said, in a number of other countries, uh, also are, are warning signals, and including the fact that in Germany we're seeing at the same time a sort of drive to the center with the uh, Grand Coalition, uh, but a polarization going on with um, part of the right going further to the right and part of the, of the left, the young socialists especially, going further to the, to, to the left. So it's a sort of unstable arrangement that is uh, being uh, worked out. I think it's important that they do it. It creates a window uh, for, for Europe. Uh, it's, as President Steinmeier tells the Germans, uh, the German party, it's a duty for them. They've been elected to try to find an arrangement, but we should be under no illusion about what it tells us about the state of, of, of German public opinion. So I strongly uh, agree on that. And let me say also that I found uh, uh, striking what you said and the, uh, the sort of coup of what you call the Brexit elite. To me, they're the sort of equivalent to Bolsheviks. Yeah. Uh, it's the same yeah. sort of uh, intellectual and political framework. You don't have a mandate yeah. uh, from the electorate, but you're uh, using an opportunity uh, to, uh, you know, to push for an agenda for which you have really no, no mandate. Now, what makes things very difficult uh, is that it creates uh, an atmosphere of distrust uh, uh, between the U27 uh, and the UK. Because what can you agree if you have this you know, risk out there that uh, somehow uh, a, a strategy of non-cooperation, an aggressive strategy of regulatory competition and tax competition uh, will be put in place. How can you uh, find a reasonable arrangement 
if you're facing this type of risk. And what I think, I'm, I'm among the people who think we should find a way to organize a partnership with Britain post-Brexit. And this partnership should preserve as much integration as possible, uh, because I think it's a, it's a sort of very dangerous common weakening that we are we're facing. Uh, I mean, Brexit is not a zero-sum game. Brexit is a negative sum game for all of us, so we're going to lose. And the more, the harder the Brexit is, the more we're going to lose. So we have, in principle, we have a common interest in finding a sensible arrangement. Now, a sensible arrangement requires trust, and this trust is not there. And this trust cannot be there as long as we, there is no, not an interlocutor that can commit not to uh, play this card of uh, aggressive regulatory and tax uh, and social con uh, competition. So, so that's a very dangerous situation in this, uh, in this respect. Um, <clears throat> now, you mentioned uh, patriotism also. Um, I think that's, uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, but I have um, some questions about what you said on um, politics being played um, essentially at home and the sort of absence of uh, EU level uh, politics. I mean, they, it's true that the, um, the the traditional method of integration, saying you know we do it, uh, it's an elite project. Uh, we are building integration, and politics will follow up. I mean, that has reached its limits. But I still think that the number of issues uh, on which our citizens, our fellow citizens, actually uh, realize that Europe is the right level for uh, action. Uh, I think they do realize that climate change is not something uh, our states individually will, will have any weight uh, on if they, it not through, through the EU. Um, they do realize that, you know, if one to sort of, you know, have a, a robust dialogue with the GAFAs, it's not our, the states individually that are going to succeed in, the, in this respect. And I think uh, Commissioner Vetsager's uh, action was extremely important in this respect by showing that you know there, there is at one level there is a possibility of of of, uh, of taking a decision based on on competition grounds. Um, so, be it for uh, I mean issues of taxation, be it for issues of competition, be it for issues of data protection. I mean a lot uh, relies on action at the EU level, and I think that those are things that citizens can see and understand. Uh, I think on, on, on security, uh, although it's more difficult because they have very different traditions and perspectives and you know, uh, the neutrality uh, tradition and uh, the, the different perception of the threat, all that makes it extremely difficult. But at the same time, you know, increasingly, um, uh, it's being perceived that uh, to expect that the U.S., uh, the combination of the U.S. and the national nation state will be what provides us security is, uh, you know, is being, being weakened as the, the traditional perspective. Um, and even the migration, which is an extremely difficult issue and probably a sort of make or break issue for the EU in the years to come because, uh, you know, uh, if we are unable to find a common solution, we are going to end up uh, having borders everywhere and, you know, uh, being uh, uh, so uh, into retrenched uh, in, within the, the national borders. As you said, and there must be borders somewhere. Uh, even on, uh, on migration, I think, uh, with all the difficulties and all the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the division there is, uh, the realization that uh, refugees that uh, come to Europe, they enter through a certain uh, country, but that doesn't mean that they are aiming for settling in that country. And uh, the, 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 Dublin, uh, uh, the Dublin system is completely ineffective, uh, has uh, you know, largely passed its, uh, its, its rationale, and there, there needs to be a, another type of solution, and that cannot be a purely national solution. I think that's something you can, you can fight for. So I think on a number of things uh, of this sort, there is, um, there is room for, for creating a, a political conversation at, at European level um, and, um, and, and making it part of the national discussion too. Now, what we have to, to recognize um, is that the political condition that goes back to the complacency you were, you were mentioning, 
the political conditions uh, are uh, you know, very, very difficult because um, uh, we are, are facing, you know, if you go through the different countries, um, uh, and certainly responding to some uh, question that uh, Paul raised uh, when we invited me, you know, uh, the complacency should certainly not be that sort of, you know, Macron victory we, we spread and create a similar movements in other countries. This is not at all the reality we are seeing. This is not at all the reality we have seen in the German elections. This is not likely to be the reality we're going to see in the Italian election. I mean, we, we have a, we're facing a process of decomposition. And, you know, if you tell me that Silvio Berlusconi is an Italian incarnation of Emmanuel Macron, um, that may be, you know, the sort of realistic assessment of the situation that maybe he may be the closest approximation on offer, but that doesn't mean he will be something, he will be a close approximation. Uh, and um, and in, in, in Spain, we had a, a, a fairly different process. And, you know, I don't think that Ciudadanos is exactly going in the same uh, direction. I mean, Ciudadanos, in my view, but uh, Nadia will tell us, uh, it's more fighting with the PP to replace the PP. So it's a sort of more something that's going within the, the framework of the traditional politics than than a sort of uh, transformation. So this transformation of the political landscape is, uh, you know, is something that uh, happening, is happening in some countries, but uh, not in other, or it's happening in different ways in different countries. Even actually the, the, the sort of the French transformation, um, uh, we have several interpretations. I, I have, can see three interpretations of what's going on in my country. One is that um, it's the long, awaited by some uh, victory of the center. And there's some truth to it, that you know, it is, uh, it's true that uh, Macron passed the threshold of credibility when um, the center, uh, I mean the traditional center joined him. Um, but um, he did not play the sort of traditional uh, midpoint uh, uh, card of the center by finding the right balance between right and left. And actually the motto during his campaign was to be both right and left and not um, at the, mid the midpoint between uh, right and left. So it's not exactly the centrist uh, tradition. The second, uh, and I was told that by a senior German politician after a conversation, he told me, oh, oh I understand. Uh, this is a Grosse Coalition uh, French style. Um, and there's something to it. There's something to it because, you know, the, the right of the left have not, right and left have not disappeared. And uh, on some issues, uh, those, are, those are deep traditions uh, and uh, that, that drive the people's uh, uh, immediate response to some, uh, some issues. Uh, even culturally, uh, the divide may reemerge. And on some issues like, you know, uh, now asylum policy or uh, policies, I mean, distributional aspects of policies, through that through taxation, etc., they reemerge very, very quickly. So, so you have you have that reading also that is sort of temporary condition, uh, uh, you know, a little bit sort of closer to the German um, um, uh, development than uh, what I was saying before. And then you have the third definition, which is a sort of redefinition of the political space. Uh, which is uh, not along the right-left uh, axis uh, as traditionally, but more sort of a, a, along an orthogonal axis that would be open society, uh, open economy versus closed society, closed economy. Uh, but again, as you said, you know, Macron doesn't forget that patriotism is there and he doesn't define himself just in this way. And had he defined himself just in this way, you know, I'm fighting for open society, open economy, he wouldn't have, uh, have won because this is, not, uh, this is not a winning card. Uh, so I think those are much more ambiguous uh, developments. And what's interesting is uh, you know, how, how this is going to play out you know, at the, uh, um, uh, uh, after the election was won and you know, when facing the realities of power. Now, let me perhaps end here and, uh, you know, on the French-German uh, proposal, we may come back uh, in the discussion, but I thought it was uh, important to react to what you said.
I, I want to go back to something uh, Nick Clegg said about the unfortunate <laughs> fact that most of Europe's founding fathers um, were, in fact, founding mothers. Uh, we're, in fact, founding fathers because <laughs> we're, in fact, founding fathers. Because I think that if Nadia Calvino had been active in the 1950s, we'd have had at least one founding mother. Um, and that's a tribute uh, to the way you've uh, taken Brussels uh, by storm in your relatively uh, short time here. Uh, Nadia came after a very successful career in the Spanish civil service, and I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. Um, but uh, uh, she was director general of competition there, and she came uh, to Brussels initially as deputy director general of competition, uh, then internal market, and she's now the director general of the budget, which gives her the incredibly easy job of preparing the draft budget of the EU for the next multi-annual uh, financial framework. Um, she's also, as I'm sure you know, a convinced uh, European and a lovely person, as you're about to see, for those of you who haven't uh, heard her speak. Um, Nadia, we're very interested, of course, in your vision for Europe and maybe in what role the European budget could play in driving forward a, a progressive uh, modern agenda. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation and, of course, for the, for the very uh, friendly and extremely uh, well, lovely uh, introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I hesitated, I have to say, uh, when I saw the two previous speakers on the title, which was um, just announcing what we have had, which is highly charged uh, political statement. So I'm going to stay in my safe territory of the European budget, you know, which, uh, conversely to what many people think, is not at all a technically boring um, area, only interesting for experts, but quite the contrary, you know, after my now quite intense career, both in Spain and here, as you, you mentioned it, Paul. I have discovered that being Director General for the Budget is probably the most political job you can have, because what is more political than the decisions on how uh, uh, to spend public money? What are the top political priorities and, and how to fund them? So from this point of view, I'm going to, to try to make three points on, on some of the, of the areas which have already been touched upon by, by my predecessors. Uh, but coming from this angle, no? And let me start with a positive uh, comment. And I think Nick was saying there is a positive momentum. And I think that there is a positive momentum, no? So let's start uh, with something uh, which is a bit more optimistic. Citizens of at least 27 member states have a renewed faith on the common projects. There is uh, a more appreciation for the union. The latest uh, Eurobarometer is, is actually quite positive. There is a good coalition of forces with uh, Mr. Macron and Madame Merkel, you know, and the um, draft uh, program of the new grand coalition in Germany, which we're all looking forward to, uh, is quite positive about Europe and quite open about the possibility for the country to contribute more uh, financially to, to the Union. So. Um, there is a good momentum, and moreover, I also see an important unanimity or some common ground on what are the top priorities that we need to look at uh, for the future. So after 10 years just dealing with the crisis and looking back, there is a perspective of, okay, what do we need for the future? Do we need to look more and do more at European level about border control, about security, about defense, you know, many of the points that you have uh, put uh, forward already. So I think that that is already a very good basis on which to build, and a lot of ideas are circulating, which very soon, in, in a couple of weeks' time, are going to start being translated into positions with regards to the European budget. Which brings me to my second point, which is, uh, uh, what is going to happen, what's going on, because in the middle of all these discussions uh, about the future of Europe, about how to deal with Brexit, comes the negotiation of the next multi-annual financial framework. And uh, I personally think this comes a bit too soon if one thinks that the current multi-annual financial framework is still going to go on until 2020. So why do we have to put forward a proposal? The Commission is going to put forward a proposal in May for the multi-annual financial framework as of 2021. So what's, what's the haste? What's the urgency? Eh? But actually, you know, upon uh, uh, some reflection and a lot of work, I think that uh, the negotiation of the next uh, multi-annual financial framework comes at right at the right moment. And it is going to provide a, a big challenge, but it is also going to be, I think, a good opportunity for the 27 member states to get to the, together and, and decide unanimously what they want Europe to do in the future and, and how, to, how to fund it. So 
as we are preparing the proposal of the Commission and starting the, the reflections, and in the European Council in February, there will be an informal discussion of the leaders, the 27 member states, they will get together, they will start to say, what is, the, what is it that they expect from the Commission to put on the table? What are the top political priorities for the future? So that's going to be a, the appetizer. Then the Commission will put forward the proposal, and then negotiations will start in earnest. And what are the main uh, challenges and what are the main issues that we have on the table? Well, the budget is just a reflection of the political reality. So there are two main challenges, which is that citizens have increased expectations about their political systems and Europe in terms of what they want it to deliver to them. I will, I will come to this in a second. And at the same time, we are facing the withdrawal of one of the most uh, important member states, one of the largest and one of the biggest contributors to the European budget. So these are the two basic challenges that we will have to find a solution for. Easy, as, as uh, Paul was saying, quite, quite easy, if it was only uh, that. Now, what, what is it that Europeans expect? And I think this, this chimes in with, with what, uh, what um, Jean and, and Nick were saying, is that uh, European citizens really have uh, high expectations of the political systems to deliver, first of all, prosperity. We've had, in the last 60 years, a story of prosperity. Europe has brought welfare and growth and jobs to all those countries that joined the Union. Now, in the last 10 years, as you rightly said, this has not necessarily been the case, or it hasn't perceived to be the case. And citizens are calling on us to say, no, we want, you know, Europe has to deliver prosperity. It has to deliver safety, security. It has done so in the last 60 years. We shouldn't forget the, where we started, right? But there, is, there are new challenges. We need to make sure that our borders are, are well protected. We need to make sure that our societies continue to be perceived as safe, the safest societies in the world, as they are. Because sometimes we are critical with our search, but the, the, the rest of the world knows very well you know, that Europe is, is the safest and most peaceful area in the, in the world. Citizens also expect us to deliver sustainability. You know, Europe is leading the fight against climate change, how to deal with climate change. They want to be sure that this continent is continuing, is going to continue to be a place where it's really uh, uh, clear that we are protecting the environment and creating a better future for our children and, and grandchildren. And I think also Europeans are expecting us to deliver a strong society, a cohesive society. You have spoken about the, cri the, the scars left by the crisis. I think the uh, economic inequalities and the regional divergences which have been felt in some member states are partly explaining the problems. They do not totally explain uh, the, the rise of populism that we have seen in, in the last years, but, but to, to a certain extent uh, they are underlying these um, race of the skepticism of citizens vis-a-vis -vis their political systems. Skepticism which is also projected at national level, but obviously cannot be escaped at the, at the European level, even less so if sometimes Europe is portrayed as the, the culprit or the, the scapegoat for some of the problems that we're facing. So all of these questions, all of these issues are going to come to the uh, debate on the next multi-annual financial framework. No? How to strike the right balance between those no new needs and traditional policies. You know, in the last two years, uh, our annual budgets of around 160 billion euros have been, uh, for 75% more or less, spent on the common agricultural policy and structural funds. And whereas maybe a lot of people in this room think, well, actually, you know, why are we continuing to spend it? I have to tell you, there are vast millions of people out there that think that these are the top priorities for Europe and that we should continue to invest in these areas because we need to preserve self-sufficiency of Europe. We need to preserve health and safety food, safe food. We need to preserve our, our landscapes and we need to continue to support seven million farmers, which are sustained by the common agricultural policy, not to talk about the large infrastructures and the catching up needs of um, a, a number of member states and regions, which are still lagging behind in terms, in terms of, of growth and, and prosperity. How to strike the right balance between a budget for the 27 and the new proposals which have to do with deepening the economic and monetary union. I'm sure Jean will, will talk more about that. No? how to ensure that our values 
which are the core of the European project. I mean, the, the, I was listening very, very carefully to Nick when he was saying patriotism and, and national identity, and we are part of the tribe. And the problem we have in Europe is that the European project has been built precisely on top, you know, to overcome uh, those national nationalisms, if I, if I can say that. And what is the basis for our identity is our common values. So how do we ensure that those values of respecting minorities, of protecting peace, of sustainability, I was referring to safe societies, strong societies, how are we going to ensure that that keeps being protected in the 27 member states? Um, how to make sure that every euro spent at European level provides European added value? And this is much easier said than done in the sense that you know, if there are 200 persons, if there would be 200 persons here, there would be 200 different perspectives as to what provides European added value. And the added value of the budget is not only financial, it's not only economic. It is also the value of protecting those principles that have allowed us to have uh, growth and prosperity in our continent in the last uh, 60 years. So all these issues are going to be uh, on the table. There are very different perspectives, very different approaches. Our leaders will come together as of May and start putting on the table their proposals on the basis of their vision for Europe, but also their national public opinions, huh? which uh, I very much take from, from the previous speakers. We should not neglect the importance of those public opinions and the need for European citizens to understand what is going on at European level. <coughs> Let me close with three final thoughts on, on the points made before and also my, my previous brief remarks. First of all, that um, I fully agree that in the last years, uh, and, and we should avoid complacency, because the faith on the political systems and the um, economic elites has been shattered in many, in many parts of Europe. And this will take a lot of time to, to rebuild. I mean, the good thing is that uh, you can create a, dynamis, a certain dynamic, like you know, populistic movements, where you can also deconstruct them. No? So let's be positive. You know, throughout history, there are different cycles. So we will be able to, to go to a more positive dynamics. But we should not take it for granted. I, I fully agree. And we have seen this populism being translated into let's leave Europe, let's leave our country and create, you know, we're going to be much better when we're independent. I am uh, deeply um, affected by this because I am, as you said, I'm a deeply believe in the project. And I think that only going together and, and building a strong Europe will be, be able to face the challenges of the future. But there are many people who don't see it. So we have to uh, continue to, to build on those values and make them see. And that brings me to my second uh, thought, which is we cannot build this illusion on the basis of a rebate. We cannot build this illusion on the basis of give me my money back or net balances. I put so much money into the European budget, I take all that out, or I won the battle because I have more money or I pay less. Huh? There is no way to engage with citizens and to create a positive narrative about Europe if our national leaders are coming with an approach which is purely like a balance sheet. No, Europe is like a bank account where you put the money and you take the money out. And that doesn't make any sense at all because the European budget and the European Union is not a zero sum game where some only win if others lose. Then you know, I would just close the shop and stop doing my job if I thought that this was all there was about it. There is a positive value added of working together and of building this union. And when we look back, if we see what we have been able to achieve with 1% of our GDP put together in the European budget, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, people, you know, when you look at projects like Galileo, but now in the future investing in, in European supercomputers, no? the infrastructures that we've had, the fact that Europe is leading the world in humanitarian assistance, that this continues to be the safest part of the world, the most prosperous, the richest, the economic convergence that we have achieved in the past, you know, the, it's amazing, you know, so it's something, it's so, something so positive that we, what we need to ensure is that we continue to, to, to grow in this direction, to go in this direction. No? But somehow, I don't know why, for many decades, a lot of people have been wanting to bash this and to think uh, this is just you know, a waste of money. And we put the money into a black, into a black hole to, to fund this, uh, what do you say, perfidious pen-pushing bureaucrats, you know, which is, uh, yeah, okay.
no comment on that. So uh, my, my conclusion on this is that we need member states to engage in this positive narrative because Europe cannot build this narrative from Brussels, and that's what Nick was saying. You know, it's not through conferences here. It's not by talking amongst us. We need those messages to be passed through to citizens, and for that we need the engagement and the complicity of the leaders that we'll meet in, in February in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and I am optimistic. I, I really think the momentum is there. And then the third uh, reflection is, is just to wrap this all together, to think we have achieved so much. There is a very uh, positive perspective for the future. It's going to be extremely challenging, but it is also a good opportunity. And I think in that sense, the proposal for the next multi-annual financial framework is coming at the right moment, because if the leaders of the 27 get together and are determined to have an agreement even before the next parliamentary elections, that could be an opportunity to show good governance, a unanimous view on the future of Europe, and a good response when one of the members of the Union is withdrawing. Uh, and we need to define what do we want Europe to deliver for us, uh, the, the 27 member states and the uh, 400 million citizens in the next uh, decade and, and beyond. And we're working to that aim, and I'm optimistic that this time will be different and we will be able to have a fast negotiation leading to a unanimous decision and surely for a brighter and better future for all of us. On that positive note, let me close the remarks. Thank you very much. Okay, just, just briefly before we open the floor to questions, I want to go back uh, to our other panelists and give them a chance to respond. Uh, Nick, would you like to go first and then um, Jean? Uh, no, no, not really. Um, <laughs> no, no, because I'm keen, because I, I know I spoke far too lengthily before. Oh, so. but, but you were very interesting, so you mm. can go as long as you want. I, I spoke length, lengthily too, but I'd like to react to, to what Nadia just said about the budget. <clears throat> well, first, two points. First, I think, you know, it's fair to recognize that uh, we do not spend the money very well. And that's a reason being that there's much too much inertia. <coughs> and the reason for this inertia is that the negotiation structure we have to agree on the budget favors inertia. So let's face it. I mean, the, the legitimacy of uh, EU spending uh, is weakened by the way uh, EU spending, uh, EU, the EU budget uh, is, is negotiated. And as long as we continue this way, um, there are going to be understandable reluctance to uh, change the size of the EU budget. Uh, I'm speaking, you know, as a Frenchman, I know very much that my country has been always fighting for the common agricultural policy. I'm not sure it's a, the national interest, but that's a different point. Uh, but I'm sure that the structure of the negotiation leads each and every country to stick to the spending it benefits from, irrespective of the quality of the spending. And I think it's unreasonable. My second point uh, has to do with um, um, distribution, with inequality. I think the, the, the danger we're facing is that the, the contract, the traditional contract, was uh, <coughs> the EU provides prosperity and cares about inequality across regions. So, convergence. The member states, they uh, take care of uh, inequality among uh, individuals and entities that are smaller than regions. And I think this contract is broken. This contract is broken because people care more and more about the distribution of income. Uh, they care more and more about the, the distributional consequences of uh, all sorts of policies, being trade policy, being liberalization policy, etc. And, uh, you know, you can't talk of prosperity without uh, immediately discussing distribution anymore. That was true in the past. That's not true anymore. And when discussing that, the EU sort of is, you know, has one instrument, which is regional policy. And for the rest, it's clueless. And regional policy does not correspond to the level of uh, intervention that would be needed. We know, for example, much better what have been the consequences of uh, opening uh, up in terms of trade policy. It's much more granular. It's cities, you know, it's cities, it's, uh, it's industrial areas 
that have suffered from Chinese uh, competition. It's not regions, you know. It's not, the regions are much too big. So, I, for, you know, there, there, are, there are political reasons why regions were considered the right level. But that does not correspond to reality anymore. So basically, you're telling the member states, take care about the consequences. The EU is, is doing something that's, you know, I, I wouldn't dispute that it's sort of overall prosperity enhancing, but doesn't care about the, the, the fine distributional consequences of it. And I think that this type of contract is, is less and less acceptable in a period where people care much, much more about distributional issues. Let me just follow up with a question, if I could, right away, because you made your criticism of the current process clear. My question to you would be, how could it be done differently? How could an EU budget <clears throat> be negotiated in a way that had more credibility of the type you suggested? I, I think, you know, the reality is that everybody cares about net balances. It's wrong. We know it. We, uh, we know, as from an economic standpoint, this is not where the value of the EU uh, is. I think uh, Sigma Gabriel uh, said that very clearly the other day. But that's the reality. So let's face the reality. Let's start with the net balances. Let's agree on net balances. And then after having agreed on net balances, uh, you know, open the discussion on the content. Because the, 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 the problem with, with negotiating the way we negotiate is that you stick to the policies you benefit from just because uh, they are beneficial to you, not because of the quality of those policies. Okay, thank you. Nadia, would you like to come back on that, or, or no, would you later. actually not yeah. like to come back on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd rather open it to the we'll floor, and I will react to... later when we okay, have this. Okay, thanks. I already saw Christophe Leclerc uh, raise his hand, and if the rest of you were running a little bit out of time, and Graham Watson uh, as well, and Joe will go to you too. Christophe? Thank you. Christophe Leclerc from button, the... Button, please. Pardon? Press the button in your mic. Uh, there are two buttons, then. Thank you. Christophe Leclerc. Yeah, it's on. Christophe Leclerc, from the, from the policy media, you're active. Uh, two very short observations and one question to uh, Nick Clegg. First observation, in a typical British understatement, you forgot to quote yourself, and notably your book, uh, How to Stop Brexit and to Make Britain Great uh, Again. Mm. Second observation, I guess from the faces I know, you have about half uh, of British people in this room and the other half uh, continental. My question is, could you give hope to both sides of the room, <laughs> to the Brits and also to the Continentals? As was pointed out uh, by Mr. Pisani-Ferry, uh, this is a lose-lose uh, situation in which we are. So both sides of the room have something to gain. You have ideas on how to turn things around. Could you excite us about that? By the way, from, thank you. From my point of view, I see only a room full of Europeans. Uh, Graham, would you like to? Yeah, we'll come to you in a moment. Yeah, and can you introduce yourself as well, please? If, as if you needed any introduction. Thank you. Graham Watson, former member of the European Parliament. Um, I wonder if I can ask a question of, of Nick and possibly also of Nadia uh, to get more into this question of patriotism, because I thought we had some very interesting, very valuable ideas coming out of the, of the presentations. It seems to me that the difference between a patriot and a nationalist is that a patriot loves their country mm. while a nationalist hates their neighbors mm. but my question would be is one person's patriot not another person's nationalist mm. are we embracing the patriotism of the madrileños or of the catalans are we embracing the patriotism of the serbs or the kosovars is the challenge not to create what winston churchill called a wider patriotism and a common citizenship for the distraught peoples of this turbulent and powerful continent. Here, here. Joe, and could I ask you to say a few words about Radix as part of your question as well, too? And to introduce yourself. Stephanie, bring you a microphone. Thanks. Hi, my name is Joe Zamit Lucia. Um, I'm one of the trustees of Radix. We're a think tank for the Radical Center, started in the UK and um, now expanding across Europe, so going against the grain as it were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I have a, a, comment, a kind of observation to make. Um, we, talk, we tend to talk a lot about detailed policies and, 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 and what filters down is just perceptions. Um, so I have a question. Um, it seems to me that there's a possibility that there's a perception growing that Europe has changed 
from, if you like, a cooperative organization to an organization of coercion. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I think that probably wasn't helped by some of the events we saw in the Greek crisis and the Cypriot crisis. Um, <clears throat> and I wonder whether, <clears throat> you know, if the Franco-German motor starts to fire on all cylinders again, whether that will be interpreted as yet another <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> system of coercion from the big to the small, and even whether the budget becomes perceived as a tool of coercion. Um, and I think unless Europe gets back to a cooperative Europe rather than a coercive one, I'm not sure there's much <laughs> future. Okay, thanks. I love easy questions. So, uh, Nick, uh, we'll, let, uh, we'll um, let you go first. Uh, well, th thank you so much for uh, plugging my best-selling book, um, <laughs> which would sell even more if you'll go out and buy your first or even your second copy uh, straight after this, because uh, I'm sure many of you read it, um, which you're right is entitled, in, in case you didn't hear it, uh, How to Stop Brexit and Make Britain Great Again. Um, and look, in a nutshell, um, look, just, uh, just on Brexit for a minute, um, a number of, just a couple of observations. Firstly, this week, uh, is the week that um, the illusion of a so-called soft Brexit has died. I mean, it was always a nonsense in my view, but there was a feeling that maybe, 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 maybe Theresa May would pluck up uh, courage, which she has never displayed hitherto, um, to uh, defy her right wing and to try from this uh, bitterly divided referendum, which has divided our capital city and Scotland and Northern Ireland from the rest of the country, uh, divided north and south, uh, rich and poor, and crucially divided young and old. I think there was, you know, I think there was a, a slight sense that maybe she was starting to realise that she blurted out these red lines, you know, the sort of fatwa against any any obeisance to the European Court of Justice, exclusion completely from the single market, exclusion completely from the customs union. I think there was a feeling that maybe she'd learnt this sort of error of her preemptive declaration on uh, the red lines and that maybe uh, the, the debate in Whitehall and the difficulty of the negotiations was going to lead her towards trying to sort of sue for peace on a more emollient basis. Um, in other words, trying to find something which, which would try, as, as Jean and others have, uh, have uh, promoted, try and retain as much of the European integration in which Britain has been not only a part but a leading part for so long. I think that's now gone. I mean, it was always very unlikely, but it's now gone. Um, the, 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 I mean, I won't bore you with the latest twists and turns of the truly bizarre state of British political debate on this. But if you just want a little flavour of it, we had ministers on the television, on uh, touring the television studios yesterday, saying, we must leave the customs union, we must leave the single market, because we want frictionless trade. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the journalists go, oh, well, that's all right then. I mean, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> It's just, we have created the most perfect form of frictionless trade anywhere on the planet. They want to, they, and of course, these, these Brexiteers, it's such a good parallel, by the way, the Bolsheviks, because the Bolsheviks were opportunists as well as revolutionaries. They, they, they exploited uh, historical opportunities to prosecute an ideological vision for which they had no mandate at all. And these hard Brexiteers are pursuing a, a deeply aggressive form of hard Brexit for which they have Absolutely no matter, by the way, especially not from those who will have to pay the consequences, the young. 70% of which, 70% of which voted for a different future. There is no other mature democracy anywhere on the face of the planet in the modern era that has taken such a radical and abrupt decision about its own future against the explicit stated wishes of those who have to inhabit that future. Anyway, rant over. It's all, it, it's all, it, it, I think we're headed, as far as the British government is concerned, because of all of its constipated internal dynamics. Uh, it's, we're headed towards the, the, the most economically disadvantageous model of Brexit that could be pursued by the British um, government. This will clearly collide with the entirely understandable uh, needs of the EU 27 to maintain the integrity of their own of their own model, and crucially, as Jean said, absolutely not to allow the United Kingdom to enter into regulatory arbitrage, where the United Kingdom seeks to uh, retain the maximum amount of participation in the single market, but not abide by any of the associated standards with it. And this is something which the, so much of this Brexit elite that I talk about simply still don't understand. I mean, it might sound, sh it will sound shocking to an audience like this. You would not believe how much, still to this day, 
The key advocates of Brexit, Farage, Johnson, Gove, and the rest of it, talk about trade as if it's a sort of 19th century exercise mm. in haggling about tariffs. Mm. Yeah. Mm. When the thing that we have created in our continent, by the way, with British leadership, mm. was the most perfect form of frictionless trade because we recognise that it wasn't tariffs that are the most important mm. thing anymore. It's the standards, the requirements, the licence, the rules and so on. And they just can't seem to get their head around the idea that if you want to be part of that market, you have to abide by the rules of the market. There is no way around it. So that collision will still brew. Am I optimistic that um, we can somehow um, uh, back ourselves out of this cul-de-sac? I think it is more likely than not that the government will um, win the day because of the backing of this sort of Brexit elite and the sheer hysteria from the right wing and so on and so forth. But I think with each passing day and each passing week, as the sheer industrial scale incompetence of the government becomes more obvious, uh, as the embarrassment, the international embarrassment of that incompetence becomes more obvious, uh, as the real terms, consequences of these decisions become more obvious from food prices to, uh, to our access to crime-fighting databases become more, becomes more obvious, I think there is a chance that a majority of MPs may, may, uh, towards the end of this year, uh, when they are presented with whatever threadbare deal uh, David Davis has thrashed out with Michel Barnier, I think there is a chance that a sufficient number of MPs will turn around to the government and say, I'm sorry, we're not going to give our consent to this. And they'll be able... And by the way, if they did that, they would do that on impeccably democratic grounds. If I was an MP, which I'm not, alas, I was booted out by the good voters of Sheffield Hallam, but if I was still an MP, I would say, look, my constituents who voted... Those who voted for Brexit didn't just vote for a six-letter word, Brexit, because they like the sound of it. They voted because they thought it would bring a number of concrete benefits, which they were told they and their families would get. They would get 350 million quid extra per week from the NHS. Oh. They would get smaller class sizes. They would get a cut in VAT. They would get completely impregnable borders. They would get a cornucopia of new trade deals with Papua New Guinea and America and everyone else in between, which would make up for anything we lose in Europe. These were some, just some, of the very specific beguiling and seductive promises which were made to the British people. I predict, safely, that not just not some of those, not a single one of those promises will be fulfilled by the deal put to the British uh, Parliament in the autumn and winter of this year. And for those reasons, I hope, and people like me and others who are now long, no longer in Parliament are working day in, day out with MPs across parties to say, look... It's not a democratic choice. You now have a democratic duty to say thanks but no thanks. And that's why um, I haven't given up hope that a country as wonderful, if idiosyncratic, as the country that I love, the United Kingdom, will, at the very 59th second of the 11th hour, no doubt people here in Brussels will go, oh, my God, will these people ever make up their mind what they want? I get all of that. I get all of that, and it won't be plain sailing. But I like to think that our wonderful, venerable old parliament, where Churchill gave some of his wonderful speeches, as, uh, as uh, Graham just uh, cited, might come to our rescue. But there is no escape from this Brexit cul-de-sac, which doesn't start with MPs taking that courageous decision this autumn or and, winter. And let me ask, wouldn't the logical consequence of what you've just described be early elections? Yeah, listen, if, 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 you, have a, if you have a standoff between parliament and executive in this autumn and winter. And by the way, we, you know, of the many things that I'm afraid has been revealed as the, as the lid has been lifted on British social and economic and political life by this atom-splitting moment on the 23rd of June 2016, one of the th things, of course, which has been revealed is we have a deeply dysfunctional political system. We don't have a constitution. We don't have meaningful checks and balances. We have a second chamber which has no legitimacy because it's not elected. We held a referendum without the basic... Uh, hurdles that most constitutional democracies uh, require. Um, and so if you have this standoff, um, which is very, very unusual in the United Kingdom, because usually in the United Kingdom, the executive has such complete dominance because of our crazy electoral system over the parliament. So if unusually you have a, in effect, a constitutional crisis, a political paralysis in which the legislative is not accepting the recommendation made to it by the executive, yes, we'll have turmoil. We'll have turmoil. I, mean, I don't know. We, 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 might have, we might have another general election. I mean, I can't, I can't predict to you what happens next. All I know is, all I know is that at least that might 
might just give us the time and the space to think again. And my message to you collectively in the EU is however frustrating you might find the Byzantine politics of the United Kingdom, if, if this were to happen, and I stress if, rather than, you know, if it were to happen and the British Parliament were to block this headlong rush to this damaging Brexit, I really, really hope our friends in Brussels and Paris and Berlin will find some way of giving the United Kingdom the time and the space it needs to kind of sort itself out. We cannot think logically and take sensible decisions under this crazy timetable, this crazy uh, self-imposed uh, time pressure of having everything done and dusted by the 29th of March 2019. It's, 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 it's turning this fervour into, into a sort of form of political madness, and we need to just kind of take the pressure off and allow the country the space and the time to think again. Thank you. Nadia, would you like to come back on some of um, uh, Some brief comments on, on some of the points which have been uh, made before. Uh, to Jean, I would say uh, two things. One is indeed that the regional dimension, he, I, I fully agree with you, that not everything is the regional dimension. And the best example we have is here, Brussels, you know, which is probably uh, is not eligible to having EU funds, whereas we know their neighborhoods, which are you know, amongst the poorest uh, that in the country. So we have to be more sophisticated in, in that regard. And I think there is a, a call from many places to take into account not only GDP per capita as an indicator of relative wealth, but some other more fine uh, indicators, because this interest, this more social Europe, is something that President Juncker says all the time. And so that, that is a, I don't think it will be easy or that there's a miracle, uh, a magic wand that's going to find the solutions. But I think that the, the, the debate is going in, in that direction that you, that you mentioned. Where I do not agree at all, I cannot agree at all, is to start with the net balances. First, intellectually, it just it doesn't make sense because if expenditure to protect the Greek border is only accounted for as a benefit to Greece, you know, I mean, who in this room would agree with that? You know, of course, protecting the southern border, the eastern border, is a benefit to the North European countries. So, if we just account for things on the basis of where the expenditure is made, not to say about the infrastructures which are made in in Poland, which have been calculated to bring a return to German industry of 80 percent, you know, so. It doesn't make sense to look at the, at the net balances. And what about the expenditure we make in third countries? Ah, zero, no, no balance to anybody. And of course, this is, this is uh, one of the areas where there's more value added to, to all of us Europeans. So intellectually, I cannot. Huh? But also secondly, because if it only was a net balance between you know, how much I put in and I get out of some policies, but the European budget is around us all the time in many dimensions. So it is regional, it is the social dimension, it's the sectorial interests, you know, so if only this would be sorted out like that. So I think that we are taking the right approach by starting the house from the basis, which is what do you want Europe to do in the future and how are we going to fund those priorities? And I think there is a chance that this time things are not with the same kind of dynamics. I mean, if things were as they always were, the commission will put forward the proposal in May, and then our leaders will go safely continuing their own business until the end of 2020, when people will realize, oh, oh my God, we don't have a budget for next year. We need to have an agreement. Let's sit together and agree. Hmm? And so in six months' time, they would wrap up an agreement. After a couple of years of, of uh, not doing that much in terms of actual engagement at top political level. Now, this time, at least the, the Commissioner Oettinger, he is uh, urging everybody to get together, engage from the beginning so that we can have an agreement before the parliamentary elections, which is very, very, uh, of course, uh, ambitious, but it is not impossible if there is this willingness to show good governance in Europe. No? So just let's see if the dynamics are different. Let's see if our leaders are willing to engage as soon as possible. And the fact that there is an informal debate in February shows the importance that these leaders are giving to this matter and that they're willing to start discussing as soon as possible. They see that this is important and we need to have an agreement. So I have to be optimistic that maybe the dynamics uh, will be uh, very different uh, in this regard. And just, just a final word on the issue of patriotism and, and nationalism, which I find extremely interested, interesting, and also on the issue of, of a budget as an element of coercion. I think that, um, as I said before, the only way to overcome these feelings of, of the tribe or the village, the city, the country, the region, eh, 
is to look for these common values, which are the basis of our, of our union. Mm -hmm. And I cannot imagine that we should be spending money in areas which are not respecting these values or even for objectives which would be contrary to these values. So I don't see the budget as an element of coercion. I just see that there needs to be a consistency between all we do, our policies, and the way we spend uh, the public money. Okay, Thank thanks. you. John? I'm not going to go back to um, net balances, only to say that I agree intellectually with you, but you're fighting political realities. Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, I want, I, I'd, I'd like to, to, to come to a point on coercion, which I think is important. And that gives me an opportunity to sort of mention some of the proposals of this Franco-German paper. Um, on, on, the, on the fiscal uh, dimension, which is, you know, way coercion is particularly the, there because we have this all elaborate system of monitoring uh, based on unobservable variables uh, and actually quite volatile variables, uh, the structural deficit, um, and potential sanctions that are not applied but are there potentially. And so th I think it's a recipe for, uh, you know, for conflict, for uh, I mean, antagonism and uh, you know, permanent um, um, impression of being under the instruction from Brussels and uh, all the Germans or whoever. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I think this should, we should accept that it's not, it's not viable in the long term. And so it should be replaced by a system that gives more autonomy to the member states with more responsibility. So our proposal is the following. Each country uh, should have uh, an expenditure target that's based <clears throat> on uh, what the level of the public debt that's desirable um, you know, on a five years horizon. And that's something uh, other member states, the EU, has to uh, have a view on because the level of debt is something that can affect neighboring countries, you know, through the uh, contagion to the risk of uh, having uh, to go through a, an adjustment program, a conditional assistance program, etc. Um, so this <coughs> level of debt should determine, uh, you know, the path of uh, public spending with respect to potential output. Um, and th that would determine the, the expenditure ceiling for the next, next five years in, in, in nominal terms. Um, and then you could spend more if you, either if you tax more, so you're providing resources, that's just a normal democratic choice, or if, you, if a government disagrees with the ceiling, uh, they should be able to exceed the ceiling, but on the condition that they would finance it by junior bonds. What would be those junior bonds? It would be, just for the flow of additional spending, there would be bonds that uh, are automatically extended, whose maturity is automatically extended is, if there is an ESM program, <coughs> and they would be the first to be restructured if there is a debt restructuring. So um, that would mean there would be a strong market signal. Not on the stock of debt. I mean, that would be crazy. That would be a sort of recipe for creating contagion. Huh? But on the flow of the marginal flow. So if you in increase your spending by half a percentage point or one percentage point, that, that's what you would have to issue as additional uh, uh, junior bonds. Um, and um, so it would create a room uh, for, uh, for autonomy. And a government would be perfectly able to say, I have a reform program. Because I have this reform program, I want to spend more to sort of, you know, for example, to pay for a pension reform that uh, improves the situation in the medium term, or, or to pay to, to push through some uh, structural reform that, that where we need to compensate the losers or whatever. And if this government could convince markets, then it would be able to, to do so and issue those journal bonds. So it would be, you know, there would be a dimension of individual responsibility. So more autonomy and more responsibility. <laughs> So I think that's the sort of direction we should uh, aim at instead of having this elaborate system of, of, of rules that, uh, in my view, uh, you know, are, are dangerous because they have, you know, they have done some, they have been, they have had some usefulness, but they, they, it's politically dangerous to be in a sort of permanently in a situation like that. Okay, thank you. Now, Catherine, I've not 
forgotten that the last time you were with us, we didn't have time to call on you, and I promised I would come to you in the next one. So I'm afraid you're going to have to ask a question this time. Catherine, you don't know. Okay, thank you. Nadia, you... Oh, thank you, sorry. Um, you talked about, um, in a sense, the additional expectations of the European citizens um, from... Can you introduce from, yourself to Catherine? Yes. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Catherine Stewart from Intrail here in Brussels. Um, the additional expectations of European citizens uh, that the, the EU budget needs to meet, um, in addition to the old policies, the common agricultural policies, the fisheries policy, etc. And yet, in fact, many of the old policies were actually meeting those expectations of jobs and sustainability. And I think one of the issues um, around uh, the budgeting of, 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 um, of Europe and the way it's presented, and what's been, Nick was referring to, really down to the democratic grist of, of Europe, is that people don't see the connection between these larger scale pro projects um, and, and their effect. And what was most striking in the EU referendum in the UK was how those areas who were the greatest best beneficiaries from EU funds actually voted for Brexit. So it's really more of a comment than a question, but I think there's a huge amount of work to be done uh, in, in presenting and renaming so much of what we do to more 20th century terminology than the, the 20th century terminology of the past. Okay, thanks. And I, I notice we're running way over time, so I'm going to abuse the microphone now and ask the last question myself. Um, I'm a very lazy man, and rather than giving concluding remarks, I'd like to ask all of my panelists to do it. So, Nadia, my question to you, after you've answered this additional very simple question on the budget, um, uh, my question to you is, what will you take from the debate today? And what would you like to leave with us? Because actually the way Nick put it was politicians are up here and people are here. I see it actually the other way around. I think people are here and we need to find our, our place in this world. Uh, what will you take from this debate? Well, thank you very much. And, uh, and I take back, well, first of all, Catherine's uh, suggestion that we stop calling things like Heading 1A and the CASP and the EMIF and the ETP. You know, that it's incomprehensible. Eh? So I, I fully agree that we need to have a more readable budget. Now, if I can leave one, one idea here is that um, there needs to be a positive engagement, you know, and, and um, of course, uh, Realpolitik will be uh, calling the shots at the end of the day, but at least the starting point, I think, is leading to optimism. And in that sense, we have to build on that basis. And the European budget should not be perceived as, a, as something which is negative, but rather as something that can give value added and allow us to have a more prosperous future. And it is, maybe if I can say a different thing, is it affects all of us. You know, I would not like this debate to be uh, only led by those that have a direct contact with the European budget, because our future depends partly on what we, inspe we spend the money and we invest the money in. So all of us should be engaged in this kind of discussion. Thank you. Uh, Jean, could I put the same question uh, to you? What uh, would you like to leave and what will you take from the debate? Um, I was, uh, was impressed by um, Nick's, uh, I mean, grim picture of the situation in the, um, in, in the UK in the Brexit debate. Um, I was still hopeful that, um, you know, there was a way to limit the damage. Um, so basically what he's telling us is that we should go all the way to the edge of the precipice and perhaps there will be uh, at this point a way to avoid the damage. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I'm going to, Nick, in addition to my question to you about what will you take from this debate, I'm going to throw another one in that I think is probably on the minds of a lot of people in this room right now, which is how can we help? Right. Um, uh, how can you help? Um, you mean in Brexit? Oh, well, uh, you can take uh, it any way you want. Uh, uh, well, I, 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 gen I genuinely think um, if, if you are in any way um, uh, associated with um, British politics or or have friends or have a home in Britain or, you know, I, I, I do think old fashioned pressure on um, MPs is going to be tremendously important. Um, so I do, uh, um, I do urge in that best selling book that we mentioned earlier, um, <laughs> I, I do actually say, I do actually really lay emphasis on something very, very old fashioned, which is going to see the politicians who are supposed to be your representatives and telling them what you think. 
um, uh, and far too often now, particularly because social media has become such a sort of uh, such a sort of form of self-expression that people think if they've posted something up, they've done something. Actually, you still need to go. Uh, in you know, I was I was in elected politics for what close to 20 years, five years in the European Parliament, 12 years no yes so, uh, in uh, in Westminster, and I I remain struck looking back on it how much actually just good old-fashioned eyeball-to-eyeball contact is still the most powerful form of human communication, and it's one that is too often not used uh, at uh, moments of great political um, intensity, as certainly the United Kingdom is going through now. Now, my, my final enduring thought, actually, is um, uh, listening to the ingenuity of Jean's um, approach to this all-important issue of... Um, uh, of, of, of um, sort of the next chapter of, of integration in the eurozone, and, and listening to Nadia's uh, wonderful infectious optimism, um, uh, I, I guess it sounds remarkably naff. But uh, you know, I spend most of my time having to listen to people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, <laughs> and so you have no idea how refreshing it is to stand on a, sit on a platform with a Frenchman, with a Spanish lady, um, and and just be rem and just be reminded at a very uh, emotive level what a remarkable thing it is that uh, has been achieved in Europe. I mean, different cultures, different languages, different traditions in this extraordinary, uh, extraordinary, um, uh, if, if sometimes troubled, um, but remarkably diverse continent of ours. It is an extraordinary undertaking. It's never, ever been done in this way, with this ambition, anywhere else in the world. And uh, I just think it's a great, great shame the United Kingdom not, might not be part of it, but I still live in hope if at the 59th second of the 11th hour on the precipice, we might still be a fellow traveller nonetheless in the future. Good, thank you. And even though I said I wasn't going to give any concluding remarks, um, I will give two uh, very short ones before we thank um, all of our speakers. Um, I'm struck by something we've learned in 15 years here at the Lisbon Council, which is there really aren't any problems that we can't solve if we sit down and talk about them as adults, looking one another in the eye and seeking out our common interest. That may sound like a cliche, but it's not. It's a very powerful idea in politics, and it's actually what made Jean Monnet uh, who he was and brought us all together in this room. And I was struck by that. Even though there are disagreements, uh, we're all smart. We all care for our country, our family, our places we come from. Um, and if we can stop the shouting, we can conceivably get there to something better than we have today. And the other thing, too, to, to pick up Nick's theme about um, them and us, um, you know, we're working hard. Nick's working hard. Nadia, Jean, too. We're all working hard. But it's really about you. And when you go home tonight, talk to your friends, talk to your family, because if people can't stand up for some of these ideas, uh, we're going to have a mess around them. We need to, we need to keep the flame alive um, and understand our own personal responsibility in the future that we're trying to build here. So at the end of the day, my message is to you. But actually, the real message is thank you for coming. Um, and there's a drink served um, outside. <laughs> and join me now in thanking our wonderful panelists, in particular, uh, Nick Clegg. <laughs>